we have a very, very special guest joining us here on Six String Alliance. We have long-time Billy Idol guitar player, uh, Grammy winner. Uh, session credits include Michael Jackson. He's worked with Tony Levin and Terry Bozio. Uh, loads of solo albums and solo projects. Robert Palmer, Vince Neil, the list goes on. Steve Stevens, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah, great. How, how have you been? How have you been uh, uh, dealing with lockdown? Uh, you've been quite busy, I believe, even, even though you've been in lockdown. Yeah, um, uh, we uh, we actually, with Billy and I, we had finished our our, uh, our shows in Vegas just as COVID hit. Yes. Um, but we had already made plans to record new music with uh, producer Butch Walker. And, um, and Butch is kind of a one man army as, as it would be to, uh, recording wise. He engineers, has his own studio, plays every instrument. Yeah. And we said, well, we'll, we'll all quarantine and we'll get together. And the three of us, uh, managed to, to, uh, be productive and, and continue on with our plans. And, uh, I think that was really a saving grace to still have an outlet. I mean, yeah. obviously, obviously, um, you know, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, I would go from my home to the studio, back to my home, stay yeah. home. And, um, so, so that aspect of it and, you know, musicians by and large, you know, uh, most of us have, you know, other home studios or something. And yeah, we, definitely. we, we, we're, we're sort of, uh, n you know, mole people to begin with. We're just yeah. locked away anyway, working the, 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 the not touring aspect obviously was, yes. uh, you know, was was uh, not great. Yeah. Um, but we're back to we're back to playing shows, and uh, and it's been great. And people are really, really appreciative. They seem to really, uh, you know, be taking precautions, and and yeah. um, and you know, uh, as we are with our crew and band and everything. So um, we've uh, we've you know. Uh, you know, manage to record, reproduce, you know, uh, release music and go out and tour behind it. So have you been doing some solo, uh, music as well? I believe you've been working on some, some follow up of the, uh, the flamenco stuff you do. I haven't yet. No, I mean, I'm, I, I'm you know, I'm always writing and I'm always yeah. doc, I try and document everything, uh, you know, in my studio. So the ideas are, com you know, are building up. Yes. Um, but I, I, I haven't made concrete plans as to, uh, you know, what players I'm going to employ or, right. or that, uh, what exact direction, because I'm, I'm sort of a chameleon in that respect because, you know, I, I love acoustic guitar playing so much and it's a mm. big part of what I do. Uh, even when I toured, tour solo wise, um, I, I, my second guitarist is a flamenco player, Ben Woods. Yeah. And, um, so there's that side of it. And, uh, and I really enjoy that. I really, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it, it's really easy for me to express myself on a, on a nylon guitar. So there'll be, there's definitely that side of it as well as the rock side. So, uh, but I haven't made concrete plans yet. So before we get into talking about the new EP, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your history and how you got started playing. Uh, can you? What was your earliest experience of playing? When did you first pick up the guitar? Or was guitar even your first instrument? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, I uh, obviously, you know, seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and <clears throat> my aunt actually worked, my aunt lived down the street from me. She worked at uh, what was then, uh, 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 you know, now it's JFK Airport. It, it was called Idlewild and... Uh, the Beatles landed and it was such a huge thing in New York, the, the Beatles arriving in New York. And so the, my earliest recollection of seeing guys with guitars and people going absolutely bonkers for them was, the, was the Beatles. Yeah. Um, my dad brought home a, I think he paid $30 for, uh, an acoustic guitar with a music booklet. It was put out by Burl Ives, who was a folk singer mm. and, uh, he brought it home. But as he's a, you know, blue collar, hardworking guy, by the time he had dinner, he did, he went to sleep. That guitar, you know, ended up in my room. And there was um, a well-known uh, folk singer from my neighborhood in Rockaway in Queens named Phil Oaks. Yeah. And we, we were enamored with, with Phil. He was, he was, you know, for us as famous as a Bob Dylan. And uh, we all kind of, um, uh, you know, 
uh, everyone played guitar, learned Phil Oak songs. And um, so little by little, as that guitar of my dad's ended up in my room, Phil's sister, Sonny, became my first guitar teacher. So that was my first exposure. And when did you swap over to the electric guitar? It was quite a while. So I, I started seriously taking lessons uh, from, from Sonny at about eight years old. And it wasn't until I was 13 then yeah. I got an electric guitar. So that's hence my love of acoustic because all that time was spent playing, right? Uh, you know, folk. And, and just at that time, you know, folk, folk guitar music was massive. James Taylor, Joni yeah. Mitchell. Um, and, um, as I lived in Rockaway, it was a beach area. So on the weekends, everyone would bring their acoustic guitars down to the beach and play songs. And, um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, I always believe that guitar is the most is well certainly for me it's the greatest instrument in the world but also because it's portable yeah it's you can you can you know it's a protest instrument I remember seeing you know marches against the Vietnam War with guys have guitars playing strapped guitar, on yeah. you know uh, playing Fortunate Son and things like that and uh, so I realized uh, you know I could really annoy people with this instrument yeah. you know. <laughs> So who were your, your sort of earliest influences on the electric guitar? Was it like Jimi Hendrix and, and Jimmy Page and people like that? Or was there another side to you? Um, well, by the time I, I, I got an electric, I had, uh, I had um, uh, found another teacher uh, who exposed me to some jazz. And, and I, I always loved classical, mm. um, classical guitar uh, and, and w what... I came to realize it was flamenco guitar. My parents brought me to see the Jose Greco dance company and beautiful women. And, and, and it's so romantic. And I just said, what, what is this? It's not quite mm. classical, but it's aggressive. And, uh, and then, um, so I went to a summer camp where there was a flamenco guitarist, uh, as a teacher. And mm. so all these influences that I, that I, that I liked, including rock and roll, obviously, you know, when I got my first electric guitar, I think Satisfaction was the first thing I played, right. you know. Yeah. It's, it's a little hard to, you know, play, uh, you know, uh, Voodoo Child when you first get your electric, but mm. all the Beatles stuff, the Beatles catalog, the Stones, the Kinks, the Who, yeah. uh, Tommy, all of this kind of stuff. But when I first heard, I, be I believe Steve Howe was such a huge influence for, oh, for wow. me. Because he was the first guy that I heard that employed all of these other styles in mm. the context of what, you know, I didn't, then we didn't call it progressive rock. It was, you know, it was whatever, psychedelic rock or something. But he played Spanish guitar and Chet Atkins and a bit of jazz and all this. And then I came to discover Steve Hackett and, um, and Robert Fripp. And so I love those early progressive rock guitar players because I could utilize all this mm. other stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I was really into Pink Floyd and and Queen. I think it's, it's you're listening to to artists that uh, um, where the guitar player had many different facets. It wasn't right. just just wasn't one thing. So, what about you know your first kind of band experiences? Because I, I did a, a a little bit of reading up, and I I believe it was you you had a you're in a band and. You, was it that you shared the management with uh, with with Billy Idol or or something along those lines? Right. So first, I joined a cover band, um, and uh, uh, I, I uh, you know at that at that time the cover band scene where I lived in in, in the New York tri-state area and Long Island was really like a, a you, you could make a living, you could get your chops together, play in front of people. Uh, this was the same scene as Twisted Sister was, was playing. Joined a cover band and, and, and did that. Uh, we played about three nights a week. Have, I mean, we were, we were quite together, had our own mm. quadraphonic PA system and we were very eclectic, played everything from Beatles to, uh, Yes and Pink Floyd, as you mentioned. Mm. Um, and I did that for, for a couple of years and then realized, oh, well, really, um, you know, I'm ready to, to work with other songwriters, you know, I need to make my own way in this. Yes. I can't just play other people's music. I joined a band that was living in Manhattan, um, and then we uh, we 
met uh, Jimmy Miller, the producer of the Rolling Stones. We recorded an album for Island Records, Chris Blackwell's label, that was never released. And just about that time, when that band was sort of nearing its end, we met Bill Coyne, the manager of Kiss. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, and I said, really, I need, you know, I, I, I think I've got the guitar thing covered, but I need songwriters. I need yeah. pe people that I can learn from because I can only go so far with what I know. Um, so uh, a coin management uh, agreed to manage me and help me put a band together and look for other musicians. And uh, about two weeks after that decision was made, uh, Bill called me, said, have you ever heard of Billy Idol? And by then uh, in the New York clubs, dancing with myself was being played. And, um, and I knew, I knew uh, Ready, Steady, Go. And th I was aware of the Gen X stuff yeah. because, because uh, I would go to the import shops and buy the, the, the English punk records, the, mm. you know, the jam and, uh, you know, obviously the Sex Pistols. It was worldwide. It was, you know, wow, this is really different. Yeah. The, the, you know, and, but it was great. It was, mm. you know, it was great. And it, it was still aggressive guitar and it sounded, I mean, I'm just, so, I, I, if something sounds good, and, and, you know, it, it, that's what strikes me first. Mm. And that, that first Pistols record just sounded Nothing sounded like it until yeah. that came out. I mean, the Ramones were a big thing in New York, uh, but they didn't sound like the Pistols. So, yeah. Um, so I said, yeah, you know, I was aware of who Billy Idol was. We arranged to meet and, um, and, uh, I said, you know, uh, uh, cannily enough, I said, oh, well, even if you don't pick me as a guitar player, I know every musician in New York and I'll, I'll help you find a bass player and a drummer and we'll take it from there. And, um, and that's, you know, eventually we kind of uh, just sparked up a, a partnership and just mm. said, yeah, this feels right. And that so has, that's got to be like something like 40 years now or something. We're coming up almost on 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's unbelievable. So what, what are your, your uh, you know, your memories? Do you have many memories of those, you know, those early recording sessions and recording those classic songs? You know, the guitar sounds on them uh, are just incredible. You know, it's... Well, thanks. Um, uh, the first record, I really didn't know what... I had no experience. Um, and and we we were living in New York, but we, we recorded the album in... Uh, in Los Angeles. So I was really at the mercy of the engineers and, mm. and fortunately, uh, Billy's producer, Keith Forsey was such a, well, he's a brilliant producer, but also a, such a good person that he never, he never said to me, well, if I couldn't get something together, a sound or a part or something, well, we're going to bring in a session guy. Mm. He always gave me the time to discover and learn my own way. And, you know, okay, you know, He'd go to lunch or whatever and let me figure it out with the engineer. You guys yeah. sort it out. Um, but then when it came to time to do the follow-up record, the Rebel Yell album, I had already gotten some experience. We had already toured behind the first record. And and then they put us in Electric Lady Studios, which was wow. you know, that, the house that Hendrix built. Yeah. And uh, we had great engineers. And uh, one of the engineers, Dave Whitman, who had done Kiss Kiss as well as some Zeppelin and Mahavishnu Orchestra. This guy knew guitars. I mean, mm. I, I was like a kid in a candy shop and I would say to him, yeah, how do we make the guitar bigger? You know, I'd bring in something, a Van Halen one record and mm. hear that. And he'd say, oh, I, I could get you that, you know, and yeah. So he and I connected in a way that, uh, that was just like the uh, the greatest, you know. I, I I had somebody who understood about guitars and and any and and and, um, and I was also adamant that you know this was the beginning of synth synths really taking over music. And I said, well, I, you know, once again, I looked at guys like Steve Hackett and Fripp and went, well, they kind of make their guitars sound like synths and mm. things. And I said, G give me the opportunity to take up that space with my guitar. If I'm not accomplishing it, then bring in the keyboard player, but let me try. Yeah. And uh, so that's how I ended up with a lot of the textural things. Yeah. Because yeah. some of those sounds are, you know, really, really produced in terms of effects. Uh, and, and I often wondered, you know, was that, are you, were you using, you know, what were you using back then to be able to do that? You know, because it's not, not like now where we have a fractal or something where it's, you know, 
or a computer? How, how, were, how were you achieving those sounds? Um, utilizing everything in the, in the studio. Uh, yeah. Keith Fawcett used to call me the fiddler because I was fiddling with everything, you know. How, how, what does this do? What does that do? What's yeah. a harmonizer? And also, um, I, uh, I, I had a great love of effects pedals. So I mm. had a lot of boss effects yeah. and, um, and, and those pedals still stand up to the, to this day. They're still, yeah. you know, people are, are making them better, but basically by and large, the concept of a fuzz pedal, a compressor, octave pedal, so it hasn't really changed that much. No, no. And it's something that I did, I've always been curious to ask you because it is such an iconic part. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen so many people playing it wrong and, and, and obviously you've documented it on YouTube, which is the, the introduction to, to Rebel Yell with the, 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 the finger picking part. Do you think that that the parts like that came about because of your love for acoustic guitar or do you yes. think that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of, one of the blueprints for every Billy, Billy Idol song we did and still we look for is um, uh, Keith, Keith and Billy would say, we need a flag at the front of the, 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 the song to let mm. them know the cavalry's coming, or, yeah. you know, rather than just one, two, three, four, the band plays. And um, so it was up to me to come up with something, either the, the, the uh, harmonic picking at the beginning of white wedding or mm. the intro, something that kind of, uh, and also would work well on radio because the DJ is going to talk over it or something. And, mm. It's great to have a little, you know, whatever it is, five second. Or, um, that intro technique actually came from Leo Kotke. It was, right. uh, you know, the, the independent bass and, and treble part. And also, uh, really simple blues guitar players like Reverend Gary Davis were doing these kind of independent bass, uh, and treble parts. So that's really where that came from. Yeah. Folk, I've, certainly folk guitar players. I often wondered that because it is, it is such a unique, guitar part and obviously you are so known for for crossing between you know uh, acoustic playing and an electric playing so uh, i'm glad i asked that question so uh, let's talk a little bit about the new ep the roadside ep so uh, did you did you do the writing during lockdown or were those, these songs you did everything during the lockdown pr period yeah absolutely um you know we you know we would work uh Five, five days a week with Butch Walker, mm. uh, who's, you know, also a gifted writer and gifted guitarist. And he and I, I mean, he connected, uh, with Billy and myself in, in such a way. He connected with me as a guitar player. And, um, I guess he kind of cut his teeth listening to our records and said, told me, Oh yeah, I used to own a Steve Stevens Hamer guitar, <laughs> you know, and, um, but he's, he's, we spoke the same language mm. and he spoke the same language to Billy as well as a singer. Yes. So we really got on well. We were really productive. It was a song a day and a good song a day. Mm. Uh, we worked very quickly. And also he turned us on to some other, uh, writers said, you should, you should work with so and so. Uh, Sam Hollander is one and Tommy English and Joe Yannick. And, um, and it really, some of these other writers uh, were quite younger than us, but we, were, but you know, we were able to th their excitement and enthusiasm mm. about working with us, as well as exposing us to new ideas and new ways of th doing things, uh, was refreshing to us mm. and allowed us. Because one thing we've always tried to do is we don't want to repeat ourselves. We don't no. want to, you know, we don't want to write another Rebel Yell. We got that. We, yeah, you know, we've. Um, but they allowed us to dabble in the the essence of what we did, but make it fresh and yeah, present was, it. Yeah, I was going to say there were there were elements of the sound where I was like, oh, that's that's reassuringly familiar, but at the same time there was you know different production going on, and also the guitar sounds as well. There there was some uh, a quite a a. a, a, a a wide breadth of different tones. It wasn't just straight head rock, uh, some, uh, that kind of violining sort of uh, almost Ebo effect. And also there was, there was one of the guitar tones on there really, it was almost reminiscent to say like a, a Chris Isaac sounding, you know, some, some fantastic tones. When you go in and you're working on, on tracks, 
do you have an idea of what these tones are going to be or do they evolve as the track evolves? Um, I think once, you know, you, uh, I think in the case of probably every Billy Idol song, it starts with us on acoustic guitars. Um, and the three of us would sit down with acoustic guitar and go, oh, okay, uh, I've got an idea. What's the concept? Here's the idea for the song. Okay. Mm. Um, and then we start to, to create, parts that really enhance that is it a romantic song is it an angry song is it mm. a fun song yeah oh well are we touching on americana stuff and obviously with that kind of twang guitar thing that yes you're, yeah you're yeah. mentioning um you know that was uh you, you know we had touched on that actually that was Billy's idea with uh, with White Wedding, the uh, sort of yes. sort of Ennio Marconi thing. So he said, "Oh, we could bring that out again. Let's do that." And yeah. you know, so um, and as I mentioned, you know, with with Butch being such a you know he's uh, he, he's a fantastic guitar player. Mm. So we just feed off each other. Oh, that's great. Okay, what if you do this? Okay, great. And uh, it was really a fun. Ex it, it's fun to to play guitar. I love collaborating mm. with guitarists because we all, we all love the instrument. So it's like, uh, yeah. great. What about, have you heard that record? Yeah. Okay. Let's put that on. Let's put on that old, you know, uh, record of, uh, you know, Bill Haley in the comets or something. And let's try and capture a bit of that. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic for me. So now let's uh, get to the point that all of my viewers are going to be uh, interested in gear. Yeah, right. Okay, so I, I, I'm always uh, um, interested in what people use live, and I've always I've seen many pictures of your rig, and the, the thing I love about you is the fact that you have a rig, you have a, a rig. You know, for, for me, when I when I watch it, when I, I guess it's just as a kid, I always love seeing gear. And, uh, and you seem to be one of those guitar players that still utilizes it and, and, and has, has a, a, a setup that's not, not shying away from, you know, having a big setup. What, what are you currently using for live? Um, about, uh, three years ago, we, we redid my whole rig and now it's, uh, I don't have racks anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did away with that. And then, um, so Dave Friedman, uh, Friedman Electronics, yes. you know, I've worked with since I, I had moved to Los Angeles 25 years now. And, uh, so, um, I have a, I have a signature amp with, yes. with Friedman. Yep. Uh, we're actually going to introduce the deluxe model, uh, sometime in the beginning of next year. And it's basically the same, but a little bit more versatile in that you can, uh, what I love about Dave's newest amps is you can get a, Separate master volume for right. each each channel, which is great because you can you can really say fuck off to the sound man because <laughs> <laughs> when you step on a solo you can be yeah. much louder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, but I work with Dave and and we um, we came to the conclusion that uh, that having uh, 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 a, a MIDI pedal switcher at my feet still was the way to go rather than have the stuff in the rack because then you have to run audio lines down the stage. And we found a lot of problems with noise and, uh, and uh, with, from lighting rigs and this and that. Okay, so we we going to put the pedals on the floor. And little by little, it's evolved to... I still use um, uh, the Friedman amplifiers. I'm, I'm using uh, one... Uh, I have a stereo setup. Uh, uh, on one side is a, a BE, a brown eye, when the other side is the SS, my model. Um, and then I did away with speaker cabinets and I've been using the Boss Waza okay. uh, speaker emulators <clears throat> just because I found a number one, it cuts down the time where my, my, uh, guitar tech has to set up mics, mm. set up cabinets. They get moved. They're picking up a lot of stage ambience. And we tried it as an experiment, you know, we set up my mics and cabinets and all this stuff. And then we switched. I went out in the house and I have to say that the, the was a one, you know, yeah. and it's, you know, I never would have thought that. So, uh, so that's currently, I'm not using live speaker cabinets. I'm using that. Um, and then, um, uh, what else? I, I'm still for, I, I still use, uh, some MIDI guitar 
synth stuff. I'm still on my old Roland GR33, I think it is. Right. It's, uh, it just, it's for what I need, uh, you know, I just mm. use like string and ethereal patches and things like that. And I, I play um, Godin uh, acoustic and they can trigger MIDI quite well. So, so that's, that's really it. Um, as far as the gear, yeah. So with with the the boss unit, because um, I know you you used the two note stuff uh, in, a, a while ago. I've been using the two note stuff, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I also use the the Mesa Boogie uh, Cab Clone as well, the Cab Clone IR, uh, which is still two notes. But um, okay. within within um, the 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 boss is is that. Uh, are they impulse responses? Are they IRs of your cabinets, your own um, personal cabinets, or are you just using a mixture of IRs? I still use the two notes. I have one uh, unit here in my studio. I th feel they're all pretty similar. All yeah. of the all of the amp loader IR uh, thing, you know, uh, concepts, yes. pretty similar. I've got an ox in here as well. Uh, I've got a, a Sir unit, uh, right, a Sir. Uh, a, the, the, you know, I have to have gear in so many different places, either in my home studio or uh, on the road. And now I have two rigs that I have to, because we have to have a B rig to fly to certain places mm. uh, in order to do shows back to back because you can't get a truck there in time if you're going to play at the other end of the country or, uh, you know, I just went out to Mexico to play a show while our gear was still in Las Vegas and so I have a B rig and so I'll use whatever, whatever is available. The, the boss, um, they were kind enough to, cause I needed two units because I'm using two amps. Uh, so with the boss, they were kind enough to, to get me the units on time. And with those, I use the Celestian IRs. I use the Sir and one of the, I guess it's their British four by 12 that comes Packed in the right, okay. uh, in the boss unit. I like to have two different uh, speaker cabinets. Right, uh, avoids phase cancellation and also you you know you you covering free each one can cover different frequencies. Yeah, I've I've been I've been experimenting using the uh, Captor X uh, uh, with my setup doing wet dry wet with it, which was yes. fantastic. It's such yeah. a and again you know you don't have to have. Uh, Loads of speaker cabs. You know, you can. I, I, I think. I, I. What? What's? It's an interesting uh, question, actually. What's your thought on profiling and modeling? Um, I've not done any of it. Um, I, I there. There are people that I've I've seen who have uh, who have done it, and really sounds great. Mm. I have a I have a camper. Um, yeah. You know, um, I've never done it because. I've never been in a situation where I can do it properly. I think mm. I, if I was it, if I was in a proper big studio where my whole rig, you know, because obviously when I go into record, I'm using real amps and yes. capturing because you want to capture you. If you're going to pay $175 an hour for a studio mm. in a nice room, might as well utilize it. Yes. So, yeah. uh, so when I'm recording in a big studio, then I'll, I'll, I, I would probably bring in something that I can capture just to see how it works. Yeah. Um, I've heard great results with it. I have not done it, but other people yeah. have great, great success. So what about guitars? You've got your signature Nags guitar that you use. Is that your go-to? Certainly. Um, and it's evolved over the years. Um, Nags, I had a PRS that I absolutely loved and I had toured with. I didn't know that Joe Nags made the guitar. Uh, Peter Wolf, who is the, uh, uh, I guess, president of Nags, yes. co-president, uh, he was, uh, with me from the Hamer guitar days and contacted me out of the blue. Uh, Peter and I had, had, uh, anytime I would go to Europe to do something for Hamer guitars, Peter was my guy and I always liked him. And he called me out of the blue and said, I'm with this new company, Nags. Actually, you have one of our guitars. I, I don't own a Nags. Oh, well, that PRS is made by Joe Nags. Oh, okay. Well, send me something. And, it wasn't quite the guitar for me. Uh, and I said, you know, I like this guitar. It's certainly, you know, craftsmanship. It's not. And Peter said, we'll build you anything that you want. And I went, Oh, really? So any, I basically have a guitar company and a, and a, and a, uh, shop at my disposal. You know, I had been approached by other companies and I, and I, and I thought, well, this is, uh, you know, uh, 
if if I'm at another company and 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 uh, you know I might get I might not be the priority and it nags. We we could build upon that, and I trusted Peter. So we over the years we we started to develop things, and now there's two two guitars. One is a uh, what's called the SSC, the custom, and it's basically a single cut guitar built the way that 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 I personally like like it. I you know <clears throat> when I'm in a guitar company and it's I I don't really care whose name is on the guitar. It's I want to please myself, and I yeah. there are. It's a tool to expedite the ideas in here. Yes. And if other people like and, and they want to put it out on the market, that's, that's great. Other people might like it. Some people may not like it. It might not, mm. you know, I, I, I happen to like uh, big baseball bat type necks. Yes. I believe a lot of the sound uh, of the guitar comes from the neck of, of the guitar. And, uh, you know, primarily with Billy Idol, a lot of my work is rhythm guitar. Yeah. So I need a guitar that really plays well as a rhythm instrument. And I don't need a skinny neck that I can fly all over. So my guitar has, has like a 59 style, mm. uh, you know, neck on it, bit bigger. And, uh, and then we came out with a, um, uh, a guitar fitted with a Floyd Rose, which is more the uh, the shred, if you will, um, and that covers all of the stuff like the whammy bar, pyrotechniques, mm. all that, all that stuff. So I'm covered between those two guitars. Uh, uh, I uh, if I need to go in and, and do a recording session, all I need is those two. Those two guitars. So talking about signature gear, I have one of these. So do I. Wait, where's mine? <laughs> Funny that <laughs> mine looks just like yours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the uh, uh, the the J Rocket guys were very very generous and kind in uh, donating this pedal to me and said, uh, you know, check it out. I actually played this at a gear event a year ago and loved it. It's I, I think it's an incredibly unique pedal. Don't worry, there'll be some close ups that I'll uh, that I'll shoot that I'll cut in. So there, I'll hold it up there, but. Um, Having a pedal that's got uh, uh, an overdrive pedal with a graphic EQ, yeah, you know that's you don't see too many of those. It's such a a, a tone shaping tool. Well, it is, yeah. Uh, um, they had sent me one of their Archer uh, pedals, which is fantastic. Yeah, I guess it's I guess it's you know based on the K style. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pedal, uh, which which is uh, you know that circuit for whatever reason really marries itself to your amplifier and guitar. So it's not, to me, it doesn't sound like you're suddenly stepping on a pedal. It's just more of, of your sound. Yeah. And it keeps your sound and your, your, uh, the way that every guitar player individually hears things. Um, and I said, well, this is great pedal. I said, you know what what would be a great, but I was always using it with a graphic equalizer after it so that it has a certain mid-range, inherent mid-range bump in it, as I will. Um, And sometimes I I like having that, but sometimes I don't want that. Sometimes if I'm in a session, I'm having to EQ the guitar because uh, when you're recording, you don't want all these frequencies building up in one place. Right, yeah. Um, you know, if you record your your rhythm tracks, then you go to do a solo or something. You want more more right. mids or whatever. Yeah, separation. So I always use the graphic afterwards, and I spoke to Chris at, at J Rock, and I said, "Well, is it possible to build in one one pedal post uh, gain structure an EQ that overall could shape the pedal?" And he said, yeah, "I think we could do that." And this is what we what with what they came up with. What I didn't realize is that. Uh, how versatile it is because if you turn the gain fully off, uh, counterclockwise on that, mm. uh, there's no distortion at all. It's a clean boost. Nice. And, and you can then, uh, use it solely as an EQ pedal. I've used it for acoustic guitar. Oh, wow. Uh, to brighten up an acoustic or, or, or dip a certain frequency when I'm tracking. Um, so I find it, you know, it's a super useful tool in the studio and, uh, and, um, sometimes I'll play a room, 
Uh, I have one on my pedal board, and sometimes if I'm in the room, I always try and go out in the front of the house and hear my guitar and check my solo sound. And, mm. hmm, certain things are reflecting off the, the room itself. Okay, so I'll dip that frequency for that night. Yes. And maybe it's complete opposite the next show. So it enables me to, to you, you know, uh, to really carve my tones in any situation. Oh, I thought it was a really, really well thought out pedal um i've always relied uh very much on the amp and you know if i'm going to introduce a pedal it has to have something you know normally i i like to to use boosts clean boosts or right. or treble boosters but uh yeah. this pedal really you know got my attention we'll be doing a demo of the pedal as well so uh any of you guys watching the video you'll be able to check out the pedal as well and the other the other thing i'll mention is that um uh, 10% of the proceeds of all the J-Rocket pedals go to Children's Cancer Fund. Oh, wow. Their entire line, it's, uh, and they don't publicize that, but if you go on the website, you'll see that, and that was mentioned to me, and I thought, uh, oh, oh, well, I'd actually be doing some good by selling yeah. these things as well, so, uh, so good yeah, on them yeah, for doing yeah, that, you know. Yeah, very much, very much. So, um, solo material, as well as doing all this session work and the, the work with Billy Idol, um, Atomic Playboys, Flamenco, A Go Go, and another album as well. Uh, you did the album with, uh, or two albums with Tony Levin and Terry Bozio, which was that slightly dipping its toe into prog. And, you know, that, that must have been a lot of fun to put that album together or those albums. Sorry, should I say? Yeah. Did, I mean, um, God, I mean, just to, to, you know, Terry, I had been aware of and, and, um, the, 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 the idea for those records came from Terry. And when he met with his label, they said, well, um, you know, we'd like to do these spontaneous in the studio off the fly, uh, type of rec, uh, type of project. Uh, and they threw the, the, the usual names of guitar gunslingers at Terry and, he threw my name in there and they went, Oh, that's interesting. But yeah. ter Terry, like myself, uh, you know, as well as, you know, uh, being with Frank Zappa and, and UK and all this stuff, you know, Missing Persons was a pop band. Mm. And, um, and I guess he saw a similarity in what I do, uh, you know, having, you know, uh, having, having the technique to, to play. Uh, some progressive stuff, but also love, love making music that, that people can enjoy and yeah. maybe shake, shake their ass to a little bit too is, you know. Um, so I arranged to meet with Terry. I went out and he was living in Texas at the time and we just hung out and jammed in his garage and we said, yeah, you know, this, this, we had a lot of musical things in common. I had seen missing persons and, uh, and actually the first time I saw Terry was in the B B Baby Snakes, uh, mm. movie, the Frank Zapper and went, who's that drummer? Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, um, uh, and then we said, well, we, we, we got to find a bass player. And I, I, and we, you know, said, oh, who, who, who should we get? And I said, well, we'll probably never get him, but man, the ultimate guy would be Tony Levin because he, he would solidify this. Mm. He'd lock it down, you know, and plus, those frequencies and techniques in the Chapman stick. And, yeah. Uh, and as it turned out, he was in between the, you know, King, King Crimson and Peter Gabriel and, uh, he agreed to do it. So, um, uh, you know, I, I will say I was very nervous going in because the first record had very little overdubs and everything was written spontaneously mm. just by jamming. And I thought, oh, well, these guys are, you know, on a certain level, technique wise, that, that, uh, is intimidating, you know, and, um, but, um, but they must want me there for a reason, you know, mm. and I just had to go with trusting them, trusting me. So that's, that's one of the things that I find very fascinating about your, your career and you as a player, because, you know, when you're playing with, with, with Billy Idol and, and writing and recording and touring, as you said earlier, that's music you can shake your ass to. That's music you can dance to. But then you also like to dip your toe into, you know, experimental instrumental music and instrumental rock and, and the flamenco stuff as well. I, I think it's, uh, I, it's very unique, I think, to, to find someone who, who does so many different activities. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little bit, 
maybe uh, you can't pigeonhole me, uh, you know. Um, yeah. Ho- hopefully you can identify me when you hear me. Mm. Um, but as a, the thing I told Billy when we first met, I said, uh, you know, I'm not a punk rock guitar player. I love a lot of that stuff. I love XTC. I don't know what's punk or, um, but I love, the, uh, you know, uh, Talking Heads, Television, yeah. uh, uh, Blondie, all of the stuff that came out of CBGBs. I, I just, you know, it, it was such a great sea change for music because it had become so stale and I had lost interest in all the, in these bands that I loved early on. And, you know, they had, it, it had kind of run its course and here was this fresh new way of doing things. But I said, one of the, I said, Billy, wouldn't it be great to have a guitar player who was capable of doing anything you could call upon? But you, you didn't, it's, I feel it's better to have these techniques and facility at your disposal and take the best of them rather than have a guitar player who's very rudimentary. You always have to push. Yes. Yeah. And you can't get anything more than what you ask them. Cause yeah. sometimes I'd throw an idea, which is totally out of left field and suggest something that, that some of the people I work with would have never thought of. And sometimes it's not right, but at least I'm presenting something. Yeah, something different. And also, in terms of uh, solo albums, Memory Crash album, what an album that is, man. That is such a great record. You Thank know, you. The, the, the guitar tone on that, it's so organic. And, and, and also you have one of my favorite artists of all time, Doug Pinnock. He's incredible. He's, oh, he's great. Yeah. 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 Any plans to do a follow up of, uh, of guitar instrumental stuff again? Do you think? Um, you know, I have been approached to, to do something like that. Um, but, uh, it's th- that record was actually difficult for me to do because I'm so, I have to have melody, you know, mm. I have, music has to have melody for me to hang my hat on. And, um, and I'm always, as much as I appreciate a lot of the shred guitar or guitar instrumental records, um, a lot of them, I'm always wishing, I'm always waiting to hear a singer or yeah, something. Yeah, on. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the one guy who you don't do that with is Jeff Beck because he's yes. so, he sings through that instrument. His, mm. he's, th- there's all of us and then there's Jeff, <laughs> you know, he's, it's just, he's figured it out and, and, mm. and he also draws upon, such roots rock stuff at Cliff Gallup. And, and he's got this background that none of us will have because mm. he cut his teeth in the, in the sixties, uh, you know, doing pop records really. And, and yeah. so he's, he's got that in his head. And um I don't think Jeff ever thinks about the technique. It's just a natural thing for him. I, I, I think I, the, the most intimidating gig I ever did was playing guitar with Jeff Beck, which, <laughs> which will live with me forever. But being, yeah. being in rehearsals with him when I was told that he was joining us and then spending time with him, uh, backstage before the gig and sort of sitting with him and, mm. and him saying, uh, what would you like me to play? I said, Oh, could you play? Where were you? And he had a little Vox practice amp and he did the, did it for me just there off the cuff, just absolute incredible, incredible guitar yeah. player. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, it's melody, but that, that was on that record of yours. It's full of melody. Right. That's what I tried to do is, is, inc- and also tried to delve into a lot of it, you know, certain things, um, were uh, homage, homages to some of the guitar players, uh, like Josephine is, is definitely Steve Howe influenced. Mm. Um, uh, there's one track, uh, th- that's very Hendrix influenced. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, obviously doing the Robin Troweth, uh, song with, yes. with Doug. I tried to dig into the records that, the, that, that kind of made up what I, what, how I play today. And, um, um, so I'd love to do one, but, but I, I, I will tell you that it, that I find it personally, uh, difficult to do guitar right. instrumental records, uh, because, you know, I sit down and I start noodling and go, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you yeah, know? I, yeah. I, I, need, I need a great melody. And when I work with singers, that's their job. And I yes. go, you know, when I work with Billy and he comes up with a melody, I just go, man, I know what to do with that. Yeah, I but, know what chords to do. But maybe that's why your instrumentals work, because you have that mindset. 
you know, instead, instead of make, instead of making it all about which lick do I cut and paste together to make this as jaw dropping? It's, it's primarily melody. Right. Right. Okay. So just to kind of wind things up, you've had such and still do, uh, sorry, have such an incredible career going from, you know, movie soundtracks, working with Michael Jackson, you know, playing that iconic guitar solo. And, and obviously the day job, if you like, you know, with, with Billy Idol, you know, what do you think it takes? For a guitar player to become, you know, a Steve Stevens, you know, doing so many different session gigs and and being successful, you know, what what do you think it takes these days to be able to do that? A lot of a lot is willingness to admit when you don't know something. Uh, I've never been afraid to ask how to do something or say I don't know. Um, I always try and show up prepared. Uh, the worst thing in the world is to, to show up for a gig and not know it or try and bluff it or something, you know. So show up prepared, be professional, um, be a, be a good person, get on mm. with people. Yeah. Be the person that they want to be around rather than, uh, just hire you for the gig or something. Um, and, uh, I, I'd say purely musically, listen to music outside of, what you do, um, mm. you know, uh, I, 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 I'm aware of new music. I listen to a lot of new music and stuff, but I primarily, I listen to a lot of classical music. Movie soundtracks are really what I enjoy listening to. And, right. um, and also allow yourself to take, take in ideas to feed the, the fire like films or, uh, doc, I watch a lot of documentaries on people, on artists and mm. movie filmmakers. Uh, a lot of my approach with Billy and why it's lasted for as long as it has is I look at it almost as a, as a director, as a film director. Mm. And you're working with actors because I'm the musical director. So the guys in the band are the actors and, and, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and treat people with, with respect and, uh, and, and just be fun. To, yeah. you know, be, be, you know, have, have people skills. Yeah. Um, you know, I've worked with, with a number of musicians, uh, you know, over 40 years who, who are amazing musicians, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be on a tour bus with, with yeah. them. You know, all the guys in our band are just the best. We, we, we enjoy being together and going to dinner together and, um, and, and hanging together. Yeah. Most bands that you look at, even if they're, Drastically different people have drastically different interests, different families, different. When they get together, they they're, they're, they complement each other. Their chemistry, even if you disagree, um, you know, it's it's. Don't take it personally. If mm. if 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 you're not a writer on a song, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're th- yeah. you're there to 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 contribute the best that you can and let people utilize that and don't try and have an agenda about it. You know, mm. uh, I never look at what I do with Billy Idol as a, as a, a vehicle for my guitar playing. I, I never have. Yeah. It's a, it's a vehicle for the song. That's fantastic advice. Steve, thank you so much. I've taken, oh, my, I've, I've taken my pleasure. so, so much of your time. It's uh, all good. Today. It's all good. Um, it's all good. It's wonderful to talk and meet you and, uh, Great. good luck. Good luck with the tour. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I know they'll be in Europe touring next year, so maybe if you see it, uh, let us know. Come, come down and and and, and get, get a, catch a show. Yeah, I I believe you are playing in Sweden, so uh, yeah, it would be great to come down and hang out and see the gig. You have an open invitation. Thank you so much. All right, see you. Cheers. <laughs>